Hello, welcome once again to Pale Blooms and Beyond. Thank you for joining us. Gerald Thomas Moore, aka G.T. Moore, is an English singer-songwriter and multi-instrumentalist who has enjoyed a recording career since the early 70s. Starting with the blues, Gerald gravitated to folk rock with the band Heron, which is my first encounter with Mr. Moore. In 1973, broadening his horizons, he formed the first all-white reggae group, Reggae Guitars. Gerald has worked with such luminaries as Jimmy Cliff, Lee Scratch Perry, and Johnny Nash. Afterwards, he stayed busy doing session work in Europe and Amsterdam, and ended up relocating to Amsterdam for a while. Mr. Moore then spent a few years trading, recording, and playing time between England and Belgium. Over the years, he has released a number of solo albums, singles, and collaborated with many artists. Well, welcome, Gerald. Thanks, man. Good thank to be for, here. Yes, it is. It's, and I thank you for joining me today. Well, let's go back. Uh, I'd like to go back to the beginning. Um, where were you uh, born? I was born in Reading, Berkshire. Okay. You know, Reading's uh, sort of halfway between London and Oxford, but it's really out in the country. Okay. It's a nice place, really. What about some of your memories of your childhood there? Oh, well, you know, it was, um, it was very austere in the 50s. Uh, you know, uh, there was still rationing. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't much money. And all my family were, you know, like really exhausted from the war. Right. And there was a certain atmosphere, but that's in a way what when the 60s happened, which was pretty quickly, you mm -hmm. know, it was all it was all fun again and everything was colorful. And, uh, you know, it wasn't austere as it was when I was a little kid. Right, right. Do you remember uh, some of your earliest recollections of hearing uh, music in the household? Well, my dad was a singer. Okay. And my um, my granddad was a piano player. Oh, okay. And in those days, uh, I didn't ever see my granddad play the piano because I wasn't allowed in pubs. Right. Uh, but my dad, I saw him uh, sort of singing popular op opera the local theater, you know, but generally in those days, you know, people didn't, um, how can I say, um, they didn't worship music in the same way they do now. You know, right. it was like, oh, you play music. It was no big thing. Right. And so right. they didn't make much of a thing of uh, music with anyone really in those days. So you get the uh, the music gene from your your dad's side of the family. I have no idea, man, where it comes from, okay. you know, I think, you know, genes uh, are, do big jumps, I think, uh, but no, I don't know, I mean, my, my family say, like, where the hell did he come from? <laughs> right. <laughs> Genetically, you know. Well, well what about, uh, can you remember one of the earliest uh, uh, singles or albums that someone got for you or that you bought? That you oh, yeah, from? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, basically through my life, I I always have like an album that becomes like my Bible. It, okay. I do want to play everything like on that album, and I just want to know every single note, and I play it, you know, over and over again. So the first album we really had, which is what my mum bought us for Christmas, um, was with the Beatles. Oh, okay. So that's really the first thing that I personally got into, you know. And then after that, the next year, I got uh, the first Rolling Stones album, and I played that, you know, you know, Route sixty six, Oh Carol, Mona, all those tunes. I just knew them inside out, and oh. then it's it. I, I I suppose it would like stuck around for like a year where you just listen to that. You'd listen to other things, but you'd really know every single note. And then after maybe a year or so, you get a bit tired and want something new. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right. Well, you began um, 
playing at an early age, uh, what, 14 years old? That's it. Yeah, yeah. That was great. I mean, well, we had um, the English Martyrs Youth Club. The okay. English Martyrs were the uh, Catholics that were um, martyred by Henry VIII. Oh, okay, right. So it was, you know, it was a, a real Catholic school. Uh, but like uh, they had a thing like if if the the boys and girls get together and they're all Catholic, it, 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 it's better than if they meet people that are not Catholic. So, you know that ba that youth club, oh, it was great. I mean, uh, I sort of did an audition. I think when I was thirteen, and I forget the tune. I think the first tune I ever sang, and I think it was that tune. Um, you better move on by the Rolling Stones is also by Arthur Alexander. And right. that, that was the first tune I learned to like sing in public. And I practiced in my bedroom and I gave it a go, you know, and then I, I won the audition to be the singer of the youth clubs group. Yeah, yeah. The the, the Beatles also borrowed from Arthur Alexander. He was, he yes. was influential. Uh, yeah, that's it. He's... Um, uh, you know, the Stones and him, and every song he ever wrote, really, was about a threesome. It, it's, it was like or like a little drama all the time, like, you, you better move on, I'm, you, you're, it's my girl, you move on, and the one he did with uh, the, the Beatles did, Anna, Anna, yeah. go with him, yeah, you know, it's, and he was just a brilliant writer. Yes, he was, yes, he was. Well, uh, was this around the same time that you started getting into the blues? Well, I mean, uh, really, um, 13, 14, I didn't know anything about anything. And I just liked what my friends at school liked. Okay. And they told me like what was cool. Yeah. And I willingly accepted it. And it was like, what was cool was first, the thing I remember was Dave Brubeck. Yeah. Dave Brubeck School and on Square Dance and uh, Paul Desmond and Take Five. Five. That was cool. And what else was cool? Um, Charlie Christian playing with the, uh, is it Benny Goodman? Uh, uh, that was cool. And I, I listened to that. And they saw people just started, to, you know, you, you hear Smokestack Lightning and a couple of other of these great um, chess Chicago things. And uh, yeah, I think the first band we had was called the Muddy Waters. Right, right, yeah. We, 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 loved, we loved, and that was my Bible at the time, was the Muddy Waters album, Muddy Waters Live at Newport, mm -hmm. the Newport Festival. Yeah. So that's how I got into it, I suppose. Yeah. Did you ever get a chance to see him in, in concert? No, no. no. Uh, yeah, no, I didn't. I'm just curious about that. Well, uh, we'll talk about those early days because you were in a couple of three bands. Uh, yeah. blues talk, talk about that a little bit. Okay. Just a second. Sure. Uh, sure. Can you spray it's on the, on the piano, I think. Sure. And we just, yeah. Oh, well, um, everyone was playing the same music and mm -hmm. i think john lennon said it like everyone was playing chuck berry yeah. and but it wasn't exactly all chuck berry but it was all that kind of rocking tunes you know like sound dam dam sound dam dam and then into the rhythm and like um so it could be like little richard or or a song like that you know people would but most bands started with either um uh too much monkey business mm -hmm. or johnny be good okay right right you know and but like everyone was playing that so we all got into it and over a couple of years you know people got better at playing it and uh, i was in different bands and eventually i bought i joined uh the soul band, which is a band at school, uh -huh. the Memphis Gents. Oh, okay. Well, how was that? How was that experience? Well, that was this experience of my life, really. I was okay. always looking back to how great it was with them yeah. throughout 
um, probably 20 or 30 years. But we were just kids. We 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 opened up with Sam and Dave's um, Sam and Dave's uh, what's it called? Uh, Hold on, I'm coming. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -da -ba -da. And then they used to do a couple of instrumentals because all the soul bands did that. They yeah. did uh, two or three instrumentals and then they called on the singer. Mm -hmm. And then the singer always did a big front man show. Uh -huh. you know, not exactly like James Brown, but in that tenor, right. you know. And so, yeah, that was, a, that was a great band, really. But we're still at school. And we... In the rehearsal, like we we had these Carnaby Street suits, which was a time of those soul bands. They sort of slowly went into like uh, hippie clothes, you know, like they wear caftans. It'd be a soul band with caftans. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, like, um, yeah, they... Hang on a second. I'll just have a spray of this. Sure. They... They would do a, a thing and I, I would do this big show with the Sam and Dave tunes mainly, but we did all of the Temptations hits. Uh -huh. And the Temptations had about five or six number one hits. And they were the, actually the most bought and popular band in Britain in the 60s, in the soul time. And Sam and Dave were also the most... Uh, bought and uh, and liked a uh, band from Stax. It wasn't Otis Redding. They'd never seen Otis Redding. Really? But there was something about Sam and Dave, the, the, the mods and the young guys picked up on, yeah, you know. Yeah. But when, right. when, when Stax came over, uh -huh. then it all changed. They yeah. saw how good the show was. Right. You know what I find fascinating? I think it's a few years later down the pipe is the Northern soul scene. You yes. Know, you know, yes. and how popular that was. Yes, yes, and, yes. The different well, clubs would play that music, yeah. yeah. Well, I remember, you know, we didn't go a lot no up north that much because there was not that much happening and everything was happening in London. But right. um, when I did go up, I, and with the reggae guitars, we had the same thing there were big pockets of, of people that were really into the music uh -huh. in a way that they weren't down south and in the way that they weren't in London because there was not a lot happening up there. Right. So when they got into the music, it was like the big thing of their week to go down to the club. and. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, I know... Uh... I guess back in the, in those days and in the 60s, you know, if you really wanted to make it, you had to go to London. You know, that was the place yeah. to be, you know, to do yeah. that. Well, you eventually uh, started to take in more influences and started leaning a little more towards uh, the folk stylings. Um, you even played with three of my all-time favorites, John Martin, Roy Harper, and Ralph McTell. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. How were those? How were those gigs? How were the? Do you well, remember? actually, um, it's not a linear story like that. Yeah, it's um, the folk was always around, always, and the folk was is is the roots. Like I went to a Catholic convent where mm, most of my friends were either Polish or Irish. Okay. We had Irish. Uh, nun who used to take us for singing and when she started singing the Irish song she said oh forget the lessons we'll just sing for the rest of the afternoon that's what we did <laughs> and a lot of these and you had it on the radio too you know the BBC were trying to educate us uh, what our folk music was yeah. and then you had the folk revival really of the 50s which was all about um in, a, in, in the 60s and at that time, there was a big move away from the cities to, to live in a nice place in the country. Okay, right. A lot of people did it and they started to like get back to their country roots. And okay. part of that was learning the old farmers, agricultural songs and all this sort of, kind of thing. 
Right, right. Yeah, I always find that fascinating. So it's always, sorry, sorry. So it, the, no, it's, it, it's not like a linear story when I got into this and I hung out. You know, the story with, um, we met John Martin. He come down from Glasgow. I think he was 17. Okay. And he was had his father with him and he did a local folk club. And we just uh, said like, wow, you know, he, he was obviously an incredible talent and uh, the Ralph things uh, and Roy Harper, they, they were just around and there were lots of bit in the Dylan mode. But yeah. then you had this whole scene of what I call the finger pickers. So okay. finger picking really came in. And I was, I think I was at art school. So I was like 19. And uh, I thought, well, I better learn how to finger pick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and I did. And I think the first tune I learned was from a student at, at the art school, um, a, a Donovan tune called, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh i dug you digging me in mexico it had this it was on uh one of his early albums i think it was on sunshine superman oh okay uh, yeah. but it was a picking it was a picking thing you know uh -huh. and i had to learn that and also i see things in a you know, so I went to art school and when I was at art school, was I going to do music or was I going to, uh, you know, learn to do art and this sort of thing? And in a way, the 60s was like that, too. Everything was mixed up. It was art, music, but it was also fashion and style and the way people wore different clothes. It was it was it was very, I, I suppose you could call it eclectic. Yeah. lots of things coming from all different directions and that's when i look back at those times especially the early heron, heron records um i was i was all over the place i was playing every different style and i thought it was cool and we tried to um the the record company didn't really want it they wanted another album like the first album okay. and i said well no you know and, and ting and ting but they said, like, well, there's so many different styles. How are we going to sell it? And then <laughs> right. uh, that's well, what talk, happened, I suppose. Talk, talk uh, prior to that, talk about your first uh, solo tune, I Wouldn't Mind. Oh, were you, yeah. Were, I was you happy thinking with, were you happy with that? Oh, man, that was one of the most joyful moments of my life when I heard the um, the you know, they have big tannoys in the studios in those days. And all it is is an acoustic guitar and the voice. Yeah. But the way the engineers used to work on the guitar and the compression and a little bit of... And, of course, you, when you've never heard your voice in a studio before and you're, 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 you're thinking, is it going to be all right? And then when it comes out, it's, you think it sounds great. <laughs> How can that not be me kind of thing? But like I was thinking, because I'm I'm helping my daughter with, um, uh, she's making an album, and I was thinking of that session and and telling her about it, uh, where like uh, it was done at something. Well, I can't, but it was, um, I was building up to the session for about six weeks, and w what song am I going to do? And that's the way I work too. I when I go in the studio, I really want there's only one song that I can do. It's got to be this one. And if I do that well, then we can think about another tune. But so like I was preparing for that. I wouldn't mind session. And it was in Timpan Alley in, in Denmark Street in London. Yeah. It was like it was like really, you know, this is showbiz and I'm a kid. <laughs> the country you know and it's my first record i think i'm 21 mm -hmm. you know and it was just a great great session so you enjoyed that well it's interesting that uh, as a song I ended up on a compilation album with uh, other tracks by tom robinson who would end up forming his own band years later tom robinson band 
No, it's a Tom Robinson. Yeah. It's a different Tom Robinson. Oh, different, different Tom it Robinson. Is. Oh, but, okay. but that Tom Robinson uh -huh. is in the reggae guitars. There you go. Okay. I was I had that later on. So it's two different Tom Robinsons here. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. But but Tom, the other Tom Robinson of the band was in reggae guitars. Also, on that compilation was another friend of yours, Mike Cooper. Um, well, Mike, Mike set me up with the deal. Yeah. And Mike was helping me all the time. I would just go around to Mike's and just say, can I come with you to your gig? <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, he would say, and uh, I mean, he was a very impressive guy in every way in those days, especially. And he dressed well, he played well, he played this, uh, the, like the National Steel, and no yeah. one else was playing it. And his first album, it's like mostly like Robert Johnson, but no one was really hip to it at all. Yeah. And like, there's a story about Mike, um, the, uh, like Mick Jagger and Keith Richards wanted him to join them. Uh, oh. he, he, he had a band in Reading called the Blues Committee. Okay. And the blues committee, well, as a guy that I still play with from then, Jeff Hawkins, but um, uh, Mike turned uh, Mick and Keith down. He said they weren't bluesy enough for him. Uh -huh. <laughs> but he was such a, sorry, I to, I, that's a story I heard, you know. I wanted to show you this and see if this brings back any memories. You can, uh, can you see that? Not, re not really. Machine Gun Co. Is that? Oh right? yeah, that yeah. album. The Machine Gun Company. Yeah, there, that one. Yeah. Right. Well. Yeah. You played uh, on. Yeah. You played on that. You played on that. Yeah, I played, and Heron sang on 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 his albums too. The Trout Steel album, uh -huh. and what's the other one? There's another. I think he did three albums with Pi. Uh, okay. He used us a lot for for backing vocals and harmonies. Heron okay. on his okay. album, uh, but yeah, I mean, we were really great friends. Like I said, he would be t I'd go to the gig, and then he would say, "Is it all right if Gerald does a couple of songs?" Yeah, and then they, they didn't really want it, but it was the sixties, and you you wanted to be cool. You know, so yeah. like in the beginning, some of these hard notes promoters would say, well, all right, OK, OK. And then, of course, I try and bring the house down. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, but, but later you, uh... on, when I when I came back. Sorry, no, go ahead. Keep... when I came yeah. back to England, uh, um, I I formed a band of some of my old friends, uh, G.T. Moore and the Outsiders, mm -hmm. and we did some different recordings and gigs. And and Mike was the, the rhythm reggae player. You know, I got him into my reggae band uh, to sort of pay him back in a way. OK, well, let's talk about, about Heron. Uh, yeah. who, came up, who came up with the name, first of all, Heron? Um, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I don't know. OK. Well, I'll say I did then, okay? Um, and uh, <laughs> I have to go back in time, take my time machine and go back to that time. And then I'll say that I, I, I came up with the name myself. So, uh, but talk about how you formed, how, <laughs> talk about how the band formed. Well, it, again, it's, it's, it was the scene. It was all happening, so like Heron, Heron were a different band. They were basically a copy of the Incredible String Band. Right, okay. And that might be why they called themselves Heron after Mike Heron. Mike Heron, right. Right, but then yeah. I asked Tony, I said, you you named it after Mike Heron, did you? And he, he said, well, I can't remember what I named it after. So I'm not sure if that's a true story, but um, yeah, they were playing around, but... Um, it was a special scene around Maidenhead, uh, okay. which is like very a bit like here. It's rural, it's cool, and it. it they had a, a folk club by the river called the Dolphin, which all the art students went to, and everyone was like sixties dressed, and it was all very cool. But they developed this style of music that was finger picking again, 
but mm -hmm. like songs about life and your personal relationships and this sort of thing, instead of songs like Sam and Dave about, come on, let's get up <laughs> on, do the thing, and all this other thing, you know what I mean? So, but that was, a, that was a whole scene. It wasn't just around Maidenhead, it was in Britain. And okay. I think beyond Britain in Europe, where the music changed from this basically dance music mm -hmm. to listening music, where it where really and that and the singer song. So I would often I had a thing in those days where if I saw a band, I'd try and just jump on the stage and play with them. Mm -hmm. I didn't care. And okay. so like we did a tour in Israel and I, there, we, there was a, a band um, that were all in, in, in this uh, Israeli army camp near Tel Aviv. And I just jumped on the stage and started playing with them and they're like smiling. And yeah. then they, that, that was the kind of thing and they would, they would and quite often happen is they would look at me like, what the hell are you doing on the stage with us? And that is fun and playing. And then, so I did that with Heron quite a few times. And they liked it, you know, because they were a bit pedestrian. And it sort of livened up the evening. Okay. And um, I sort of um, actually, like, I had a deal with Pi Records with Peter Eden, who's the greatest producer the greatest and I've done some stuff with him last year or so but we'd been working for two or three years and uh he was right behind me and I I went to him one day and I said um I don't want to do my album with you I want to do it with Heron and he didn't like it at all oh, he man. said like your stuff's better than their stuff I want to do your stuff and then I said, yeah, but they're my friends. And that was the whole thing in the 60s, getting it together with your friends in the country. And I believed all of it. Yeah. You know, a few days later, I didn't think the same way. <laughs> you know? I made a mistake, really. It was a big mistake. And I was thinking it recently, um, you know, looking back, which I don't look back much, uh, it was a mistake. I should have stuck with Pi and done my own thing. Okay, well, but, yeah. you, you, you know, I joined. Yeah. Sorry, you, you I, but I joined, it and then, and uh, uh, it was ever so easy for me to put in a harmony, because right. basically, a lot of the time they would sing. They couldn't really sing harmonies. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys, but. Um, you know, like they would sing the melody and every now and then one of them would break away and sing a little harmony part and then go back to the melody. But I, I could move around and sing parts and then it all became quite interesting for me too. You know, the we did a lot of basically choral arrangements, rounds, you know. Yeah. Uh, go, the thing goes round. Yeah. Well, talk about... Uh... Whose idea was were the field recordings? Recording. Oh, that was my idea. Okay. I said we had a we had a someone was doing a thing on Heron and we had to fill out this form. And the guy said exactly what you said. He said, Whose idea was it to do to to do it in a field? And like they all said, Well, I thought it was my idea. <laughs> I told Peter Reedon about this about uh, I don't know, sometime later. And he said, it was your idea. It was not their idea. You were always talking about recording in a field. And I had other ideas. I wanted to record in a pine forest. And I talked to Peter about it. And I was up for it when we went down to the country to do the Heron album. I said, if we can find a pine forest on the way, because I, I used to go in a pine forest and uh, sing. Mm -hmm. and work on songs because and thing and uh it's so dead yeah it's such yeah. a thing and plus you've got the smell of pine you know it's atmospheric and right. so yeah it was my idea right well you it sounds like you've always been uh had a connection to nature haven't you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 yeah but i am definitely in that uh, uh but like um Tony was really, yeah, uh, the singer in Heron. It, it was like, and it was a, a kind of hippie thing, 
you know, nature is a, it, it's a force. It's, um, you know, it's not just uh, pretty flowers and that kind of thing. And uh, like Tony's lyrics, like Lord and Master, uh, you know, they are really the greatest sort of nature loving lyrics I can think of. Better than a lot of the, you know, romantic uh, poets from the Enlightenment. I think it's uh, it's hippie, and it was a it was a time when you you know you loved everyone, you loved the forest, you loved nature, you know, and all this kind of thing. Everyone was connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, one of my I think one of my favorite tracks. Aaron tracks is a car crash. Oh yeah, yeah I think that's oh, really beautiful. It's not the most uplifting title, but it's it's a it's a very beautiful track, I think. And you guys harmonize well in that one too. I think. What was the what was the story behind that? Uh, yeah. Well, I really like car crash. Yeah. And uh, um, it, Tony never wrote songs; he just wrote lyrics. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was about um, a, a girlfriend he had, uh, and he had quite a lot of girlfriends then. But this was this girl he liked, and uh, she had a friend that died in a car crash. Okay. So it was a song written for her mm -hmm. in sympathy with her. Yeah. But the the great thing about it is, it's like Lord and Master, um, the the guy that wrote the melody, Robert Collins, mm -hmm. Bob Collins, he is a brilliant melody writer. You know, he gets a really, um, you know, it touches your heart. The melody, it's a proper melody. Yes, yes, it is. You, it it comes through in spades in that song. It does. Well, what were the uh, the critics, do you remember the critics' response to uh, the two albums in 70 and 71? Or, and the fans, do you remember the reception from the fans? You mean the first album and then the second album? Yes, yes. Those mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, I think when we, when we started, um, it was all happening and uh, we, we had um, the maxi single and only the hobo was, was, the, was the single. And that was the only hobo was the record of the week of the top DJ. Okay. But um, I messed up uh, the, the there was some kind of they couldn't get the records out so we sort of we were we were going to pie and do like one-off tunes or two or three tunes and so we uh, we were planning for another maxi single but a lot of it is my memory but basically peter had this idea called the penny concerts okay. and the penny concerts were all the people that were on Pi uh, were with these four bands uh, and would play these quite big venues, town halls, and that up and down the country. And it's called the Penny Concert Tour. And uh, they paid a penny to get in. Oh, okay. So it was more or less for free, but it was a penny. So it was guaranteed quite big audiences. So then, then our fan base and our what the way we played and everything changed. Okay. You know? So, um, yeah, I, I, and in a way, I think uh, we got different fans then, you know. Yeah, well, a few years later, uh, there must have been a resurgence of interest because uh, you guys had some reformations and recording since the what 1990s, late 1990s. Um, you were in one of them in 2011, and then you you performed in the uh, Joker Man songs of Bob Dylan in 2013. Ah, oh, well, that is a, a quite a big story. Uh, yeah. Basically, uh, you know, honestly, 
uh, I was fed up with Heron. I had enough of them. But my son, Mikhail, who's who's here with me now, he he runs a record company and uh, he convinced me. He said, well, like, why don't you just uh, do some stuff and get it done? So when my son, Mikhail, got involved, he arranged uh, quite a lot in the end. I started off, um, I went and talked to them and said, um, Let's do an album. So we did an album down in um, Falmouth in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. uh, we just found the studio. Uh, I kind of produced it. Uh, and that was called Simple of Us One, Two, Three, which is one of my tunes. But we did that. And then we, we planned a trip to Japan, which um, my son uh, arranged and that really brought us all back to life again. When we went to Japan, it was just incredible. So uh, we we done Joker Man, and they liked it there. And we did uh, Heron live in Japan, and then what was the? And we put out the John Peel sessions uh, on an on an album in Japan as well. So it really took how up. The, uh, how are the audience? You man, I've I'm heard telling you, I um, uh, I'm at a time now. I was talking to a, a musician friend of mine. We're in Ghent now in Belgium, and he's mm -hmm. a Ghent musician. Um, and I was um saying like, well, I'm, I don't feel like gigging anymore. I just would rather make records. And he said, well, why? And I said, well, I never get paid enough. It's never the right treatment. Uh, and uh, it's a lot of hard work, the rehearsals, the sound check and thing. And I thought to myself, after the guy left, I thought, well, I've changed since I went to Japan. When I went to Japan, everything is just absolutely perfect. The audience are so polite. They are so incredible. Yeah. When we played there, they queued up after every gig for us to do selfies with them and sign the records and that. And when we're playing, it's absolutely silent. And everyone is not only silent, they're looking at you like this. And it's not their language. They're listening to <laughs> English. They're listening. I go back uh -huh. to London and it's their language. They're not listening at all. They're shouting in your face. So uh -huh. I, you know, I I was really impressed with uh, with Japan, and I'd go and play there any day. Yeah, I've heard that too about Japanese audiences, and they would even on um, the sound checks and things like that. They were just so into even before the band started playing. They were just, yes. you know, yes. enraptured. Yes. Enraptured. yes, yes. And I had for uh, in a few minutes, I had questions about uh, uh, Amsterdam and Holland about the fans there too is they're they're so appreciative as, as well well how did you talk about uh how did you now correct me if i i mis, mispronounce this but how did you and shusha 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 guppy, shusha will do yeah shusha, shusha guppy yeah. meet and then start recording together um she was uh, a journalist with the daily telegraph and she interviewed me in her house in Chelsea on the King's Road uh, because uh, she wanted um, someone who knew about the folk scene. Okay. And I went to talk to, for, to this for this article. And then you, I, you ended up working together and-, and Well, recording. yeah, I, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, we became an item. And uh, I moved into her place in Chelsea. She wasn't entirely happy with it, but she went along with it. It was a bit small. She'd broken up with her husband, um, but we almost straight away started working on this movie, People of the Wind. Yeah. She'd gone uh, to Iran and she'd gone with um, uh, 
a director who basically shot everything that moved. Sorry, Tony, if you're watching this. Uh, <laughs> but um, so we had about six weeks in 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 editing studios in the in the film area in London. So she was there. I was there. The the, the director were there, and um, uh, we we got pretty close, really, on making that because the movies, you know about the uh, Iranian tribes, but there was quite a lot of shots of Shusha and she was singing on it and everything. And I kind of got involved with it. Um, and as time went by, um, she used me as her MD, you know, okay. and uh, I became like the leader of her band and uh, I had to um, basically get my friends to play on with her, and uh, I ended up producing a couple of her albums. Yeah, well, the uh, the soundtrack from that documentary was released as uh, G. T. Moore and Shusha, People of the Wind, seventy six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you happy with the way that that turned out? Um. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't used to working with 35 mil. Okay. With the slow things, and it took a long time, but I'd done a few films, yeah. and Tony, um, yeah, I mean, we got good reviews, mm -hmm. okay. and uh, we nearly got an Oscar. Yeah, you were nominated, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was people. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> we're tr trying to talk at the same time how what what were you saying no i was gonna uh, get up yeah. on the on the reggae guitars and ask uh, how how that all came together the reggae guitars. well the reggae guitars were originally um basically the commune band the, i i lived in a commune in maidenhead and they were different friends from the art school and uh, the area. Mm -hmm. And we all live like real hippies in the communes. We ate brown rice and uh, all that, and smoked herb and all that kind of thing. And um, we, We didn't need to go anywhere because we, we did little jobs where we had money. We had communal money and we had a local gig in Maidenhead every Friday night, I think. Mm -hmm. But I was always saying, like, we, we got to get out on the road. We got to get doing something. We really got to get moving. And they were a little bit laissez fair, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, we got, I think, one or two gigs in here and there and some people kind of said oh that's not bad but basically all through this period i i had peter eden behind me and i could I, he could get me a record deal and he could get me in the studio and he believed in me and he in fact was the biggest person in my life for probably ever you know and so like we were working with with the commune band and things just sort of um uh, we got gigs i did like a reggae tune because i i felt like it and i would have this way of just doing different things mm -hmm. and just slowly cottoned on i guess something like that yeah were you uh, were you uh, following the, the reggae scene? You know, like music coming out of Jamaica and that that thing at the time. You know that. Well, no, the, not really. Um, not but really. like, um, no. Well, that's an interesting thing because when it all started happening, the mm -hmm. the reggae scene came to me. Mm -hmm. Sixty eight, I think, is what reggae first used, but. Mm, uh, what am I saying? Basically, um, there weren't many gigs in London, so we had to put on our own gig. Okay. And uh, uh, it all really happened because Peter Eden said to me, 
uh, at one point, he said, why don't you do a reggae album? Mm -hmm. And Peter is a Jehovah's Witness. Okay. And he, he interested in reggae because of the coconuts. And we still talk today about all, all the different things, but he liked my stuff and he, he believed that my stuff had some kind of uh, he said, uh, your music's like soul music, but it's not soul. Uh -huh. And that's, he saw some kind of thing in my music. But he said, why don't you do a reggae album? So we did a reggae album that wasn't really reggae at all. You, well, you can hear it. I forget what it's called. Uh, and uh, then we thought, well, okay, if we get a gig, we'll try that stuff out. We oh. tried it out and uh, it went down really well. So then yeah. we started to try and learn how to play real reggae, you know. And really, what I was talking about before, the Bible, my Bible was uh, Toots and the Maytel's Funky Kingston album. Okay. So, like, that's what I tried to make the reggae guitars play like. And I know the producer and he, Dave Bloxham, and uh, I know some of the musicians. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 Well, so, yeah. It, but in a way, in a way, it was very different then. And when the black people heard about me, they, it started a controversy. Like mm. white people can't play reggae. He can't yeah. be any good. And then some, like a guy called Derek Morgan in those days, a well-known singer, he said, G.T. Moore can play it. He's good. You know, he's got the feel. He's got the proper reggae feel. And so it started a controversy. And uh, it was uh, it's very interesting. It, it, early when the first Reggae Guitars album came out, I think more black people bought it than white people. Okay. Okay. I was going to uh, ask you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you uh, eventually you got uh, audiences that were mixed, right? I mean, white and black. Yeah. 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 But, um, uh, what to say about that? You know, um, when when the Jamaicans come over and the other West Indians and the Caribbean people came over, they didn't have a nice time. It wasn't yeah. nice, right. but they came. You know, I don't know. I mean, a lot of them believed in, in Britain. A lot of them fought in the war against Hitler. And they, they, they were told that they were part of the British Empire and they had a place here and all this kind of thing. Uh, but they weren't, you know, I mean, not many white people saw black people in those days. And, and uh, you know, it was... Um, it was interesting because with the white young people, they they loved to dance to what was essentially a new exotic dance music. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very like soul and the, and the American black American music, uh, but it wasn't. It was it was different. It was uh, Caribbean, and so a lot of white kids that were you know like skinheads and you know kind of right wing uh, they, they they like the music and same with black people you know i mean i i did lots of clubs where people kind of came up to me and thanked me mm -hmm. for playing yeah you know uh, on a, on a big in, in the big picture you know and it, it it was really because they no one especially jazz musicians a lot of musicians said look like reggae's rubbish they can't play, they can't tune, they can't, they, they can't do this. And so when someone like me do that, it was a, a, like an affirmation that like, it's not only saying that we're not good, he's saying that we're great. It's like he likes, he loves our music. You right. know? So it was, uh, it got, had it a lot with black people. It was, it, it, often I'd be oh, coming off the gig and, and like worn out, after trying to get two or three encores, they come up to me and say, like, thank you, you know, you're such a, you know, this. And I couldn't really respond, you know, it's too emotional. Uh -huh. 
It's quite, it happened quite a few it times. Is, it is. Those days, well, yeah. you know, I think the I think reggae music is kind of the is is a is a unifying type of music, you know, from blacks and whites. Yeah, it really is. It brings people together, you know, like that, rather than dividing like so so much music does, you know. So and the and the white hey, and the really? and the blue eyed soul as well, you know, does that too, you know. So yeah. Um, well, you released a couple of albums, reggae guitars, 74 yeah, to 75, on the, agree. on the Charisma label. How, how was it being on the yeah. uh, Charisma label? How was that? Um, well, uh, in a way, I regret going, going on Charisma, mm -hmm. but it, I always do what my management tell me. Yeah. So in those days, I, you know, every record uh, company in London were offering us a deal. Mm -hmm. Everyone, including like Trojan and reggae people, but like the big ones, EMI and 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 I said, I said, well, which one do I take? And they said, well, take Charisma because he will kind of um, he'll stick with you. Uh, the other ones, they'll see if it happens, and if it doesn't happen. Uh, they'll drop you after maybe one or two albums. Just go with Charisma and go with um, Tony Stratton Smith. Okay, well, right. Tony Stratton Smith, Strat, he just fell for me and the band. He just went like, that's the band. Mm -hmm. And uh, but like they weren't really professional enough to to get it off the road and. Peter told me recent, well, in the last few years that like they messed it up really, that, that, that I should have uh, been more successful. Okay, okay. Well, I, know, I know Charisma had the, uh, the early Genesis and they were a little more uh, into uh, kind of the progressive bands and things like that too. Well, um, uh i don't think strat knew what was going on he was a you know a public school boy yeah. and it was uh he had a lot of race horses he was a great guy i liked him a lot but his um his bands were a bit like his race horses he would go to the gig and see how they ran and mm -hmm. how it went down with the crowd or they go into one of his things and uh but um, he wanted me to join Genesis. He he, uh, and I didn't want to join them. He said, like he was paranoid because Peter Gabriel was going to leave Genesis, and they were looking. He was looking for a new singer. Wow. Uh, but and they made about three million uh, kind of advance sales on every album they put out so he was thinking like this you know what we're going to do <laughs> yeah. if they don't buy the next album and thing and he said to me um i said i don't want to do it yeah i said i just want to do my own thing yeah. and he said well why don't you just give them a ring and he gave me the number for them and uh, i didn't want to ring them but i said i would so i did mm -hmm. and uh, I think I can't remember which one of them I talked to, but I got the vibe down the phone that they didn't care what Tony Stratton Smith wanted. You know, they had their own ideas who the new singer would be. And I think in the end, it was Phil Collins. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny in a way. But um, Charisma, the albums, uh, well, the first one was great in one way. Uh, we did the rhythm track out of town, and then we came into Island Studios where Bob Marley was recording upstairs, and we were recording downstairs. Okay. And it's right in the middle of Notting Hill Gate. It was it was the cool area, you uh -huh. know. And uh, yeah. they were they were working the night session in Studio One, and we were working the day session in Studio Two. Mm -hmm. uh, which was downstairs in the basement, not so flash. And uh, but John Rabbit Bundrick, a true Texan, 
You know, he was playing on both albums. He was playing on both sessions. So he played at night with the Whalers and uh -huh. he played in the day with us. It, it was uh -huh. great. You know, you could feel it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, that's that's why you wanted to do this interview, was that connection, yeah, that Texan connection there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got a big Texan connection, the Johnny Nash. I had a yeah. Texan band, really. Yeah, you know. yeah that's right. Johnny uh, that was Johnny Nash's band, uh, Tony Braunigal, um, uh, Terry Wilson, you know, they were in a band called uh, Backstreet Crawler, uh, right. which was, you know, with um, uh, Paul Kossoff. Yeah, Paul Kossoff, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's why they stopped being in my band. And they, they were in my band because Johnny Nash uh, wasn't really coming to Europe very much. And then, uh, you know, it was it was a big deal with Atlantic, with uh, with um, yeah. Paul Kossoff. So, yeah. but I got to know the Texans and the way they work. And when I first started working with them, I was very surprised of how professional they were. Okay. Because it's like the typical British musician, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're all... Um, well, you know, they're all, it's, it's, a, it's a bit like an ego thing all the time, and they're all on their own. Uh, I'm not saying it's not like that with other people, but uh, the Texans, it's uh, chick chack, you know, it was like, hey, let's get this show on the road, let's do this and dig and thing. And it was, I loved it. I loved it. I thought, like, well, at last I'm with a professional band and they can all play their instrument. Uh huh. It's great. And Johnny Nash is another thing and fantastic to work with him. Oh, yeah. oh I can imagine. So that's some good memories there. Well, as I said yeah. in the intro, you began playing in Europe and in particular Amsterdam. Then eventually yeah. you moved there. I find this interesting as a lot of the interviews that I do, artists have said they were more popular over in Holland in Amsterdam than they were back in England, you know? And right. so, the, so, the, so the, the people of, over there seem to be more accepting um, and more enthused about the music than even your, yeah. your, you know, your, your hometown and your, your, your own people from your native, native country, you know? But I've, yeah. I've heard that, that they're almost like a celebrity <laughs> when they yeah. go travel to, to Holland and then they go back Holland. home and nobody knows them. You know? Nobody knows them. Right. Yeah, well, that's a big, big story. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, if you look on the positive side, Holland, uh, like a lot of musicians that I know from then, they say, uh, you just went to Holland. Mm -hmm. You know, and they, they associate G.T. Moore with Holland. Oh, wow. he just went. And I did. But um, a lot of what it was really about um, was uh, I wasn't into punk. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of the people that we played with, they were into African music and, uh, you know, Caribbean music and Latin and, and the, the whole thing. And uh, so... We a lot of people just moved to Amsterdam, yeah. just en masse, and it was more fun over there. Um, mm. The people didn't drink themselves stupid; they were more cool and iry, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, like, uh, the audiences were much better. They were sensitive. Okay, but these audiences that are getting drunk, you know, it's not for like um, this kind of iry music. You know, yeah. I mean, you can have a drink. It's it's not a, a particular, you know, moral thing. It's it's more a sort of cultural thing. Like in, you know, we we would. Uh, I remember going to in Amsterdam one of the first gigs, and everyone's laying down in the audience. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Look, look. Yeah. Look. Yeah. yeah. And but that means they're listening, right. whereas. Uh, uh, and also, they they played a lot of African music and they played a lot of reggae. They they liked it, and you'd you'd hear it all the time. 
they played it in France as well, but the French had had their own music, uh, you know, French music and chanson music, and so there were they played a lot of black music, but in 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 Holland they played nearly all black music, uh, you know, and some rock. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, um, I find that very interesting. Well, you got to uh, you traveled to Jamaica to re record with Lee Scratch Perry. Yeah. How, how was that experience? Well, it's another big experience in my life, of course. Um, well, um, uh, it all happened a guy called um, Hank Targovsky. He's, he's passed away, but he was a very close friend of mine. And um, he... he he met these guys that wanted to start a label, Black Star Liner, and go out to Jamaica and sign up some artists. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. And so he um, he went out there and he was basically a scratch freak. He only wanted to sign scratch. He could have signed anyone on, you know, he could, Dennis Brown, the two or three out people, because they've... Uh, not a lot of money in Jamaica at the time, but he signed Scratch. And then um, Scratch, for some reason, wanted to only work with people that weren't from Jamaica. Okay. okay. I don't know exactly why. There are rumors. But um, so my friend Hank was charged with um, arranging for this to happen. And then they decided that, like, I was going to be the band leader because I knew most of the musicians that we wanted to get hold of. So then I became the band leader, and then I had to meet Scratch in um, in Amsterdam and do like an audition with him. And uh, Scratch was pretty wild. He'd um, he'd sent the uh, the press in Amsterdam. Uh, with a story when they all came round to interview him, he went to the toilet and uh, put uh, like a, a towel up, up his bum and then started writing with what it was up his bum on the wall about how Babylon was sucking the life of the black man and all this kind of thing. He was terrorizing them. <laughs> and so he was to me a pretty formidable figure. And they said, uh, I had to play the guitar on, on my own, you know, the electric guitar in some kind of reggae style. I had no idea what to play. And they said something like, hey, Scratch, this is GT. We want him to come to Jamaica and play with you. And uh, and uh, Scratch said something like, um, okay, man, play your thing, man, play your music, man, or something like that. And then I started playing and it seemed like a long time uh, but I thought it wasn't bad in fact I never played like that before or since I couldn't remember what it would be like now and then Scratch said like yeah he's good he can come so that's how I got the gig you know and got there but when I got there I mean there are so many stories really um, I never wanted to go to Jamaica and and because I uh, like I knew some guys from Aswad, they went to Jamaica, and before that they didn't have locks, they didn't have dreadlocks, they didn't wear red, gold, and green. When they came back, they're covered in red, gold, and green, and red locks, and and the music is all thing and thing, and it's a bit like when people go to India and then they come back wearing Indian clothes yeah. or something. I didn't want to do that with Jamaica. Uh, yeah. But now I wouldn't mind doing that. I've changed. <laughs> like, uh, then, but so, you know, um, so when I got out there and I'm working with Scratch and Sly and Robbie, I really saw, you know, the real thing. And uh, it taught me a lot about everything. Really. Yeah. Well, when um, in the early 80s, after your experience there, you wanted to form a strictly reggae band. Yes. No other pop or rock influences, and that was the outside. That was the outsiders, right? That's it. Yeah. And in yeah. the beginning, they were they were London Jamaicans. Yeah. Half of them, and 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 a certain point at that time, 
<coughs> excuse me, uh, I stopped singing at gigs. I, I said, oh, I don't want to sing anymore. And we just do instrumentals. And yeah. then we'd go to a gig in Germany or somewhere or Holland. And, and they'd say like, after we've done about five or six instrumentals, why don't you sing a song? Uh -huh. oh, I've got a sore throat. Can't, you know, <laughs> I lied, uh, you know, but I just got into this mode because I was really into Rico and the, the, the guys I were playing with, the, the, the London Jamaicans, they played in Rico's band. Okay. So I was really into this very austere instrumental music. Okay. Bless you, bless you. Thank you. Get another drink. There you go. That's good stuff. Belgium beer. Okay. What What's the difference between that and uh, British beer or English? Um, have you got a lot of time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's interesting because I, I, I've been playing with a Texan friend who comes from Fort Worth. Oh, okay. Uh, James, uh, yeah. James, uh, James Henkel. Okay. And I introduced him to... Uh, to the Belgian beer, and he said, well, what's the difference? And I said, well, the difference is they ferment it twice. Okay. They, they get it up to about 6%. Okay. And then when when the, the, the beer gets to 6%, um, the, the alcohol is too strong for the yeast to live. Ah. So you can't make a beer in England that's more than six degrees. Oh, but the boy. Belgians being very clever, and having a monastic tradition, they then put in like a champagne yeast for a second time, and they slowly bring it up to something like eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So it's a very strong beer, but it's very tasty. Okay. Oh, okay. See, thank but you English for beer is good, but it's much more, it's not so strong, you know. Not as strong. Yeah, well, thank you for that lesson. Uh, <laughs> Did I go too far? That's a little. That's a little added added bonus. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's right? very polite of you. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, uh, you you've kind of been all over the place. I mean, traveling. You've been like a world traveler for sure. But as far as like taking in different influences and playing with different types of musicians, how did you come to work with Polystyrene? of X-Ray Specs, of the punk band X-Ray Specs? Um, well, um, yeah, it was, um, I think it was Ted Bunting was um, the tenor player uh, and, the, and the saxophone player in, in the reggae guitars. Uh -huh. And he, he knew her and her boyfriend um falcon and they got me involved because i think she was 17 and uh falcon was quite a lot older and they were they asked me to come in and write songs with her and i came in and they lived in fulham and uh we got on straight away you know, she had had trouble writing songs. They tried it with a couple of different people. It hadn't worked. Uh, but we, I, we, I think we wrote three tunes straight away. And she said, oh, I like this guy. We can really do things. But she was ever so quiet and 17, you know, innocent and thing. And uh, slowly uh, I got an album together with her. And... Um, we became friends, you know, and then she sort of went off and a couple of years later, I saw her, you know, when she was moving with the punk thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know. yeah. Sadly, she's passed. Uh, what, a few years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I went to her funeral. I think I, uh, I might have sung something at the funeral, but yeah. there was some, quite a few people at the funeral. We'll talk about uh, the Beat Popes. Mm. The Beat Popes was really a name by our drummer, uh, Dirk van Gansbeker. Uh, 
he was always attacking the Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, because he was a Belgian and, and Belgium is, has been historically dominated by them. But yeah, the Beat Popes, really, what happened was I started uh, this... Um, I was homeless in uh, in London, and I had two little children, and we were uh, in bed and breakfast. And I got a job. I was desperate, and I got a job um, in the end building a studio for a black community association in Notting Hill Gate. So I built this studio, and I ran it for five years okay. and uh, it's another great experience but i was running it 24 hours the it was it the studio was always working 24 hours and after after five years um the government funding changed and i could have carried on it uh, uh, a local place called the tabernacle and uh, i said no I've had enough of studio. Uh, I'm going to go on the road in Belgium with a three piece. And I got like a leather jacket and a white t-shirt and some Levi black 501s or whatever they're called. And uh, I did this, what I thought of as Hendrix style, just like really wild guitar. Cause I was, I was so frustrated from being homeless for years and my kids and all this and uh, in, eventually you know like my my family broke up while I was working at Mangrove the studio and so the last two years were pretty psychiatric and uh, uh, I just flipped out on the road and it, it was uh, the beat popes just said it all and I just sort of um, say to the guys, no rehearsal, you know, I think we would start with Voodoo Child. And I would like, just go like, man, and my, my Gibson 345, if I turned it up and just took my hands off the strings, it would start making all kinds of feedback noises, you know, and then they would be doo -doo 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 and playing through it. And it was, it was all this, that's what the beat Pope was about, but slowly, we started doing like um, uh, different stuff, like do wild Hendrix reggae. Okay. So we do it wild, but then it would go down to a reggae beat and things like that. And later, we I did uh, all kinds of stuff with the mandolin and different instruments. Okay. But it was uh, it was all out of all the thing of being in London for five years in Notting Hill Gate running a studio and uh, then sort of saying like um uh, i'm a guitar player you know i want to go out on the road but it was great yeah for a while <laughs> well, all that energy came out and all that frustration yes, yes that that exactly. so that's that story yeah, yeah. well but well, the guys were great you know the musicians uh you could i had a system well, I don't have to listen to the bass player and the drummer. They do what they want. I do what I want as long as they keep time. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of improvisation. And exactly. uh, yeah, yeah. 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 I like that. I like that. Well, well, who made up uh, another one, another uh, name here? Who made up the Lost Ark Band? Who made up that? Oh, uh, that was the producer of um uh that album okay. he um yeah uh brecht uh de Bouver. he um yeah uh, it was really a made-up name for their band they had a separate band called um pura vida okay but whenever the band played with me they called it the Lost Ark Band to make to make a differentiation between the two. Okay. And yeah, I think he uh, Brecht, 
his um his studio was a direct copy of Scratch's studio. All the actual things like the Tiak and uh, and the Echo and the desk. So he wanted it like the Black Ark band, but and the Black Ark studio, but instead of the Black Ark, it was the Lost Ark, uh, like uh, um Dr. Jones, Indiana yeah. Indiana right. Jones. Right. <laughs> That was the idea. Yes. He was full of those ideas. Raiders of the Lost Ark, yeah. <laughs> Funny. Well, I looking at your uh, your solo releases, I see uh, the title Ganja Flower come up two or three different times. Was that oh, yeah. a theme or was that just a different versions of the same track or, or how, how, how did that um. manifest? manifest? Well, Ganja Flower <clears throat> um, uh, started life um, where I was recording um, some instrumental things uh, at the time when I was playing um, the Melodica album, The Outsider, mm -hmm. where it's all instrumental. And uh, I was in the bath getting ready for the session and just the uh, the chorus line came to me, you know, in my head, uh, just went like that. And when I got to the studio, I, I said, can I just put this on, on, on the rhythm so that I don't forget it? But I was just wanted it on the rhythm anyway. <laughs> uh, but then a couple of a couple of weeks later, I came back and I'd written the whole verses. And in a way, that was the beginning of me developing this style of writing where I write a lot of lyrics. Okay. So Ganja Flower really says legalize Ganja, but the, the, the verses says the, um, the Ten Commandments are enough laws for people to live by. And there's much too many laws in in modern society. And I said to some friends, I said like, you get certain laws that you feel in the stomach, like don't kill anyone. Mm -hmm. You can feel that that's wrong. Yeah. Don't steal from them, you can feel it. Right. But there are other laws like you shall not park here between eight o'clock and 12 o'clock on Sundays and Wednesdays or something like this, you know, just an arbitrary uh, regulation. Right. And that's what, that's what my song's about. And it, it, that's the way I write in a way I, sometimes I think too much. Mm -hmm. And I think like, well, what's the justification of me writing legalize the Jaganja flower? And, and I thought I thought it a lot, and that's what I come up with. Sometimes it's a bit boring, and <laughs> no, uh, no, I don't think it's so. my system. Okay, I, I don't, not me for one. I don't think so, and I think a lot, probably okay. a lot of fans don't either. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think I've always been the type. You're you're right. I think our our society, Western society, is way too legalistic. Yes. And um, and I think we should all let our conscience be our guide. I think Absolutely. That's what, you, what you were referring to, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I think I think that's the best guide. Is right on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Put it right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I noticed another in your solo material, uh, another couple of, uh, of of releases. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is that is that a common a common theme? What do you mean by common theme? Well, uh, throughout your uh, your solo material, I see a couple of those, and I don't know if that's the same song. Re oh, I remade. see. Yeah, remade. Okay. Or I, I think it is the same song. Well, uh, Jer Jerusalem, um, we got a gig in Israel, um, uh, I think in the 70s, and I was working on these um uh instrumental melodies as i was saying before like rico mm -hmm. so to me jerusalem is 
a GT more sort of emulation, let's say, of of Rico. Okay. And um, I I wrote it. The melody came into my head as we were on the plane from London to Tel Aviv, and I knew we were going to we were going to tour um, the holy sites, and I was really focused on it. And I was uh, more religious in those days. I'm not irreligious now, but yeah, I was really looking forward to uh, seeing the holy places. Yeah. Are those some uh, fond memories when of going over there? Oh, holy man. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, there were three of us. There was me, Shusha, and Isaac Guillory. Well, Isaac Guillory was a great um, American guitar player. Uh, he had a band called The Crying Shames. Uh, oh, in, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, he's a great guitar player, you know. From Chicago. But, from, yeah, Chicago. From Chicago. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. So, well, he was playing in my band to a certain extent. And uh, we all went together. And um, he's Jewish. I was studying Christianity. And Shusha was a Muslim. And we were all in the uh, the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. We were there for about half an hour. And uh, I was drawing a, a quick drawing of uh, the minaret and the view from the Dome of the Rock. And it was one of the best drawings I, I've done because I did it in 10 minutes, 12 minutes. 14 minutes, something like, get that right, do this thing, do this, that. And it was, a, every time I look at it, 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 I just see that moment that we were all in, you know, on the Dome of the Rock. And it was, we had loads of uh, fun there, really. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's got to be a great experience. And yeah. it takes you back every time, like you said, you look at that, it it takes you back yeah. there. You know? yeah. Well, well. I guess in a way, um, you kind of full circle went back to your folk roots when you played with the McGinnis brothers. That's right. Yeah. And, but as I say, when you look at it in a linear way, it's a story. Yeah. But actually, I, I look at it in a holistic way where it, it's all going on at the same time. Right. right. So like we've had pro problems with the McGuinness brothers, but um, my folk thing has really intensified in the last hmm, ten, 10 years. Like uh, I listen a lot more to Gaelic music and uh Irish, Scottish, uh, in a in a sort of deep, and learn new tunes, mm -hmm. uh, and that and uh, the folk thing. I look at it in a way like folk's always been there in my life. Like I was saying earlier, when I was at school, the nuns would play it on the thing, and we'd hear it on the radio. And I was a little kid, but the music's still there. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm much older, um, and I played with lots of, um, you know, great players in the folk thing world, and it, it's 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 very 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 different. Like it's a bit like this way I look at reggae. When I play reggae now, I really want it roots, and I want it rasta, and I want it a certain thing. When I was a kid, I wouldn't mind mixing it up like the Beatles or something. It didn't matter. It was I thought that was clever then. But like now, now also with Roots Reggae, I want Roots Folk. And we did some recordings a couple of days ago, and it's just the beautiful melodies and the way you come at them. Uh, and I was saying to another friend of mine, there's no real reason for me to play folk music at all. It's not, doesn't do me any good really in any financial or social or, you know, um, prestige way, in fact, because uh, 
but um, I just play it because uh, I love uh, the melodies, really, and and the culture, I suppose. Right, right. Well, but uh, <laughs> as a, to finish off, like it, it's holistic. The reggae's always there too. The 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 folk's always there, uh, and there's always all the other stuff. Like um, I, you know, I can write these slightly classical instrumental things and it is because it's just all in your in your culture you know in your personal culture right 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 well i think i think any any good musician i don't, I don't want to say good musician but any musician that has that in their soul and their spirit is going to get back to their roots and back to the roots you know i think I think it's one of those things that's going to draw you there anyway, you know, it may, it may take years, you know, <laughs> um, but I think that's where it all starts, you know, and, 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 you know, simplifying too, in a way, you know, and uh, just getting back to that. Uh, it's, it's a holistic, like you said, it's a, a natural process, I think. But um, I wanted to ask you, see, if you can explain the difference between Reggae, ska, and rock steady. Uh, okay. Try yes, that's the short answer. Um, well, um, ska in the beginning was called Blue Beat. Okay. And it was because of the Blue Beat label. Okay. Uh, nearly all the scar, what we now call scar, they didn't call it scar then. They called it blue beat. And uh, so that that music is basically the music from Jamaica at that time, uh, which was basically um, Jamaican jazz. It was it was the the great people were the horn players. Okay. And when, that, when I was in Jamaica. They didn't let the piano players solo, and they didn't let the guitar players solo. Only the horns were allowed to solo. Oh. The other people didn't solo. Why not? They're the rhythm section. Yeah. They don't, they, you know. So uh, the what we now call ska were these great um, players that um, looked to New York and the great, jazz horn players really the trumpet players the trombone and 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 the saxophone players and uh they played the music exactly how they wanted it it was no kind of um uh put up job okay. it was a real ethnic um style that was just natural and no one really heard it outside of jamaica but it caught on in england because they played it in the soul ballrooms yeah and <clears throat> that's scar so that is like um and and in a way the big um uh the shape of scar or what, what it looks like is that beat uh, 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 and the horns playing that which you know that that was that was new too the horns uh, 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 and and playing like this pretty up kind of horn lines and horn solos you know right. so that that was a scar but then rock steady is really it's just a name that uh, we're kind of left with but the music was changing all the time but technically rock steady was basically vocal music of these typical poppy type of um reggae tunes that were a bit like the black american tunes you know r b in like g and a minor or sometimes uh major sevenths g major seventh c major seventh where it sounds a bit like an american thing and it's a it's a vocal tune but rocksteady uh was developed like a, an extra busy bass line so like everything in the dance halls was about the bass line. So like the bass line on the ska music was a walking bass line. Yeah. 
So doom, 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 ah, 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 but then on rock steady, it was a song. And and so it'd be something like na 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 na, na. and then the the bass line would be like do 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 or something like that. And that they called that. It was basically a clever bass line, but it was because the people in the dance hall were just listening to the bass lines, and so there was an impetus to like do something a bit new a bit busier and i'm i'm making a joke of it that's the one i'm singing but that's just to explain how it is but they it was quite often not that marked you know they just made it a little bit more uh, busy in fact the bass lines and then what's reggae uh well reggae I, like I said earlier, I, I think 1968, you first heard the, the name reggae. And reggae means, it comes from the word regal or royal. And it, um, it means a message from Selassie yeah. and the king. Yeah. So um, reggae really... Uh, it's not one kind of music because it, it changed over the years. Yeah. In the beginning, it was very like American music. Because, yeah. uh, you know, um, Jamaica is not very far from and listen to all the music around the Gulf. Yeah. And it's, it's when you've got the whole Bob Marley thing. Mm -hmm. Reggae started to sound a lot more like it's looking to Africa. Yeah. And so it's not the American chords anymore. It's like A minor and mm -hmm. E minor. It's not the major rhythm and blues type chords. It's these, um, you know, uh, modal African. Great stories of Scratch. Like yeah. Scratch, <clears throat> he, he had a system where sorry go ahead he, he had a system he he would say to the band get a start jamming mm -hmm. so we would get them set up start jamming and he wasn't in the studio he was like we'd hear him walking around in the garden saying yeah noises and we see what he, he was there. and we be we'd start a rhythm and the whole thing was when the rhythm was happening he would come in okay but he wouldn't come in until it was happening so sometimes we'd be playing for 45 minutes and he's still in the garden you know <laughs> and people uh -huh. are thinking like well what's wrong with what we're playing <laughs> you know but <laughs> you know, but obviously everything was down to getting a good groove and a good rhythm. Yeah. So he 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 was he controlled the whole music, every all the music and the recordings in this very clever way. But he never had to say anything to the band. Hmm. Never had to say like, "Hey, you uh, can you play that bass line a bit like this?" Or and uh, that's the wrong beat on the snare or something like. Never had to do, he never just had these systems. When the groove is going, he came in. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he did these things where he could spin like this, right from through the door. Uh -huh. Like spinning. And they sing around like that, and then he starts singing and going like this, and the whole band would get into another gear, and they like just get everyone excited and go like this, and then then he would spin out of the door. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, I mean, I I can be a showman, but like, uh, wow, <laughs> he was something else. What what energy? Wow, wow, yeah. <laughs> What over the years, though, so, uh, I want to ask you one one more question. Do you prefer composing, writing music, or performing live? Um, it's all holistic, you know. The, again, 
You know what? My favorite really is film music. Okay. Because I'm a painter and um, I, I love mixing music with the visual image and yeah. what you can do nowadays, you know. I haven't done film music for a long while. I don't know if I ever will do any more, but um, that's what I like, yeah. But uh, in a way, in a holistic way, it's all about, you know, a life. You know, you make you make music your life and it's not an easy decision. And I've talked to people about it. I say like, well, you know, you have to actually go for it. You have to put your bum on the line yeah. and say, you know, I'm going to be a musician and I'm going to do it. And then when it goes wrong, I'm going to stick with it. And it's obviously there are lots of ups and downs, but holistically, it's a life and everything about it is great, really. Yeah. You know what? It re reminds me of this a quote from a song that, that I know. I, I won't say who the artist is, but it, it goes like this. If, if you've got one dream, shouldn't it be realized? Because if it's only inside, it starts to drag you down. Oh, yes. I mean, yeah. uh, I say to friends of mine, the whole thing of music and creativity is what's inside has to come out. Come out, right. And it's, it's, uh, it, in some ways, it's a biological thing. Yeah. Like when you, when you sing, there's something in here, you know. It's uh, it's almost a thing there, and you, uh, and it comes out. But then at the same time, like when you write a song, something comes out from the back of your mind that you were trying to forget about for the last ten years, and it suddenly <laughs> pops out, you know. Uh -huh. And and that's what it, it. There are lots of different examples of this same process what's inside goes out and uh, that's that's what i would say to some of you know, my my kids and my friends is like some people try and copy another singer for instance or something and, and try and get it like that but really you you have you've got something beautiful inside you and you you have to have you have to know that it's there you have to find it and then you 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 show it to the world and then it's a whole process that's almost magical yeah yeah when you know i mean when you when you, you do a really good tune or or something like that and it's your family and your friends and they say yeah thing and it's you can't rep you couldn't sell that in a bottle and you you can't reproduce that feeling you know but it's it's in a way what i was saying about like uh, the music life, it can be a hard life, but it's a great life because of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think um, this is my my two cents, but I think music is the highest or art form. You know, there's a lot of different, you know, art forms, but I think I think music for me uh, is is the highest. Yeah, so, you know, and the deepest, you know, it's both it's the here and here. Me too. Yeah. I, I agree entirely, man. I feel I'm, and people don't realize it because they think that music's got no artifact, really. It's just in the air, you know, uh -huh. and how can that be the greatest form? Well, think about it. It's great to rap, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is. And that's what I enjoy about these is meeting people like yourself. And um, I'm not a musician myself, but I think I have a appreciation for good music and doing these interviews is 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 rewarding to me in that in that aspect hearing about your uh, your lives and your your history in music making that connection and then sharing it with with people and then hearing yeah, you're the, doing a good job man yeah hearing you're the, doing uh, a great job i appreciate it and then getting the feedback yeah. and re the response um, that, that's always good too it's yeah. great that you take an interest in people. Oh, sure. You know, I really, 
I really yeah. value uh, the job you're doing, you know. It's very right. important that you well, do it. All right. <laughs> all right, man. All right, Gerald. It's great to... Yeah. Well, thank you again. See you sometime, hopefully. Okay, maybe you so. Never know. You never know about that, right? And you take care and all the best to you, okay? No. All right. Okay, man. All righty. Rasta. 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 Yeah. <sighs>